um, is uh, Dr. Parag Chitnis. Uh, Dr. Chitnis uh, has a BS in botany and plant breeding from the Konkan Agricultural University in India, a master's in genetics and biochemistry from the Indian Agricultural Research Institute, and he earned his PhD at uh, UCLA uh, in uh, biology. His academic, in his academic career, uh, Dr. Chitnis was a professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Biophysics, and Molecular Bi Biology at Iowa State. Uh, and was an assistant professor in uh, the Division of Biology at Kansas State. Uh, as a researcher at these universities, uh, he authored over 100 peer-reviewed or invited publications in the areas of plant biochemistry, photosynthesis, and proteomics. He mentored over 50 undergraduate students, MS and PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, and AAAS fellows. Dr. Chitnis is currently the deputy director at uh, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture, NIFA, at the USDA. And in this capacity, he leads NIFA's Institute of Food Production and Sustainability, uh, which invests uh, about $670 million for research and extension uh, annually. And for this reason, uh, we're really interested in having uh, Dr. Chitnis come and talk to us about kind of a big picture perspective of how one of the major um, federal agencies that invests in agricultural research really thinks about big data. So right. let's uh, welcome uh, Dr. Chitnis. Okay. Uh, that, okay, uh, thank you for inviting me. And uh, I, one of the things that you'll see from this, my talk, from what you already heard, is uh, I think you talked, I think most of the talks there were about data, showing a lot of data, and I'll show very little of it in my talk. <laughs> because I, I, what I'm going to talk about is the big picture, and that's what you are going to get. Uh, I really enjoyed the talks before me the whole day, uh, and this is really one of the exciting part of coming to workshops like this, is to learn uh, from uh, the people who are experts in the field, uh, and then take that back to Washington and synthesize it in terms of what kind of investment decisions we should be making in the future. Uh, let me start with this, something the Wall Street uh, Journal had a week ago. And they had an article, and again, this is the difference between like when I was an academic person, I start with papers in science or nature in, or whatever the journal in my field. Now I start with papers in Wall Street or Washington Post. <laughs> uh, but uh, what I think uh, it talk, starts talking about, and it was more about how Brazil, Brazil is taking over U.S. in many of the production of big commodities like soybean or corn. But uh, it starts with about this farmer in Illinois, and he could as well be in Iowa or Indiana, same kind of landscape. Uh, but uh, looking at his tablet, looking at the data, weather data, but not around him, but what's happening in Brazil, because that will determine the crop prices in Brazil, and then he can then harvest his crop, uh, depending on when Brazilians are harvesting their crop. So, so this is the kind of, I think, data connections that is becoming global now. And that's one of the reasons why NIFA is really interested in figuring out where we should be making investments in uh, this data science space. So my talk is about data science for agriculture. Uh, and I'm purposely avoiding big data because a lot of data in agriculture isn't in that big data space yet. In some areas, like high throughput phenotyping, that type of data is being generated, but a lot of other data we have is still kind of small data. Uh, so what I think, uh, for those of you, because when I saw the speaker list, uh, there were people from diverse fields, so they may not be familiar with NIFA. It's an extramural funding agency of USDA with about $1.5 billion budget, and it funds agriculture research, education, and extension. So NIFA is in the science landscape, and if you I don't, probably are familiar with this, where the, if you look at the consideration and use and quest for fundamental understanding, there are four quadrants of this science with the highest quest for understanding, but lowest consideration for use is the basic sciences, where agencies like NSF fund. The use-inspired science part is where agencies like NIFA or NIH come in whereas industry is doing more applied research. 
Uh, so NIFA is the Youth Inspired Science Agency. What are the challenges for agriculture that NIFA is kind of thinking about? So agriculture of the future needs to tackle a crowded, hot, flat, and complex world. And not only that, when we are talking about food, more and more agriculture is being used for non-food products so that competition between these two on the land is something that is becoming really important if we want to provide food for nine plus billion people uh, worldwide. So food for this growing population has to be sufficient, economical, nutritious, safe, sustainable, and then culturally compatible because now we are expecting that variety uh, the, of food, the types of foods that uh, we didn't expect in the past. We just don't expect just a red wine or white wine. We want specific type of wine in a specific year. <laughs> and that complexity has increasing in the demand. Just to give, make that point further, as the incomes increase in countries, then the complexity of demand increases. In the low-income countries, people look, typically look for quantity and calories. Then the protein enters in their diet more and more. Then they start thinking about specialty crops, the fruits and vegetables for nutrients. And now, the countries like Europe and US, you are also then incorporating creativity, variety, expand, ex experience, sustainability, whether it's locally produced, regionally produced, organic, non-organic, traditional, whatever. So the complexity increases and that makes jobs for farmers even more difficult in terms of producing as the economy increases worldwide. Another problem in agriculture, particularly in the US, is the farmers themselves, right? Because the farmers age, if you look at the uh, average age of the principal operator of a farm is increasing, it's close to now 60. And what it means is that we need to in also get more farmers uh, in, like, uh, attracted to uh, from the young generation into farming. But there are a lot of opportunities in meeting the challenges with the complex demand, the quantity we need more, different kinds of food. And while the people, at least in the US, who are in the farming are getting older and not as many new farmers coming into farming. But there are opportunities. And we have done that in the past. The technology has changed agriculture. We have seen that in talks before, genetic technologies, uh, fertilizers, uh, machine, uh, agriculture machinery, they have really revolutionized agriculture. We have increased that. Uh, in other words, if we look at it differently, for the same amount of food to be made from, say, 1961 to 1912, now about we need about 68% less land. So in about 40% or 30 some 32% land, you can make the same amount of food as you had made before. So I think that efficiency in agriculture is really one of the ways we can say we should be able to meet the goals of increased farming. Then there are transformative technologies and smart systems being introduced as we have seen details before. Developing new technologies, screening genotypes, phenotypes in high throughput manner, managing of the big data, breeding desirable crop varieties, and harvesting, distribution, and all those kind of uh, technologies are now entering in the food supply chain. One of this part is like gene editing. That's something that is uh, in genomic technology is completely revolutionizing the way we change crops. Uh, this is a naturally grown, like Belgian blue cattle, they are bred in the Netherlands, natural one, and that's because the single gene change that makes the double muscles in the cattle. Same gene in a Chinese company change in pigs, and you get similarly large muscle increase in the pigs, but changing a single gene which is naturally in those pigs. So that kind of shortcuts in breeding can be now made possible, and for doing this, what you need is genomic data and this correlation with phenotypes so that you can make those changes very easily. 
the technology with robotics and sensors are changing. And, and in those areas like animal gene editing, like NIFA is funding several projects, like some of the earliest work on harmless, like those cattle uh, uh, came from also NIFA funding. Uh, the robotics and sensors are also being funded in many cases for, from our ACT technology programs as well as our interactions with NSF and National Robotics Initiative and our specialty crops research initiative. We have been funding projects in nanotechnology enabled sensors or robots and unmanned aerial systems. Uh, for example, these uh, acoustic sensors for looking at the general animal well-being, in this particular case, chicken, or uh, the uh, robotic like phenotyping in terms of using UAVs, or even the deboning uh, robots for chicken too. Just as an example, one of the projects where now what they are doing is putting sensors directly into plants. And in this particular case is the orchard, so grapes, almonds, and walnuts, where they are putting the sensors directly into plants to see water uh, uh, status of the plants. So instead of measuring it in the soil and uh, then programming the irrigation systems to conserve water, what they are trying to do is to making sure you just sense the water plants themselves so that it can be, you can be smarter in watering them and then water those specific plants uh, directly. So those kinds of new technologies will help us not only optimize the use of resources, either fertilizers or water, but also then increase the yield. <laughs> Other things that are happening are getting the new types of foods in the market. And this is more coming from the private sector investments where the impossible food, and there are several other companies like this, what they did is made burgers using plant proteins, but they looked at a variety of different sources for plant proteins and also introduced legomoglobin in those burgers so that you have that blood feeling. Because that's something that irony test is something that gives satisfaction in eating burger. And those are now being served in many high-end restaurants in uh, San Francisco area. So those kinds of new foods also require data in terms of the sensory part of our foods uh, experience. So I was giving a talk a few months ago in UC Davis in the food ontology workshop where again a lot of speakers were talking about what kind of data, particularly the standards, are needed in the flavors and textures and food descriptions. And then I started thinking the plant biochemist part of me is shouldn't it be fun to like correlate it back to what's happening at the level of metabolism and then to genome so that you can see the connections starting from the genome all the way to the food experiences at the end. So those are the kinds of complexity and the data kind of uh, avenues can be available uh, in agriculture. So the 21st century farm, as we have seen before, is a lot of like uh, sensory driven, automated, and so creating a lot of data. If you saw that some of this data analytics part, like in corn yield, for example, they have in the National Corn Growers Association has this competition for the highest years, you see that they have been like in this is 14 and 15, where if the, 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 the farmers in those competitions are getting a lot more yield than the national average. And some of these are because of personalized farming solutions with sensors, optimal varieties, sensible irrigation and fertilizers, smart pest control, big data analytics. One can increase the yield potential of those crops. So for increasing the agriculture productivity, we need those personalized farming solutions, regional optimization, as well as consumer to producer integration. I'll talk about it a little bit later. So in other words, data analytics is across the food system is very important in that endeavor. So we are getting a lot of data from DNA, sensory, consumer, economic, educational, like nutritional precision agriculture, high throughput phenotyping, climate, 
And all of this information we should be now able to use at the large systems level analysis, which eventually can give us targets for interventions or solutions themselves for what farmers need in the, on their farms. So that's the kind of approach we are thinking is something that would be needed for us to be supporting in the future. And when I'm talking about the system, I'm looking at the whole food supply chain, from inputs going to the production systems of either crops, animals, forests, or uh, uh, the integrated ones, uh, or either producing food and getting it towards nutritional security or feedstocks towards economic security, data is being generated all across the system. Connecting, for example, what you see in the nutritional data, or consumer choice data, or what really they go and consume a shop, and if can that be fed back where it is the food is produced in the first place. That way the farmers can make informed decisions in terms of what to grow next year, in terms of where the consumer preferences are. Some of the uh, data in this particular uh, food supply chain is readily available, and other is not, because it's highly private. Some you can buy access to, like the scanner data from grocery stores, but the distribution and logistic data is private industry's hand. So there are a lot, the data is everywhere, it's just not readily available if you want to integrate completely in this system more. So the key challenges here are not all domains are rich in data. Non-digital or fractionated data, and, and that's something that I always bring up when I talk to the experiment station directors. Uh, we, this public-private, the public, sorry, federal-state partnership for ag experiment stations has been in existence since long time, and over all of this time, we have been uh, collecting data. There are a lot of historical data out there, but that's not even digitized. Uh, uh, there was like water stream, uh, qual water quality data, breeding data has been collected for all this time. Uh, it's probably still somewhere in paper copies, but wouldn't that be useful? Uh, IPM data is being collected over the states for a long time. Wouldn't that be useful? And some of the uh, in IPM, at least I've seen some publications where those data has been used to look at how climate change has been changing the patterns of pest emergence across the country. The other part of it is public accessibility. Uh, and this is particularly critical in precision ag, where large amount of data is available in the private sector, like Climate Corp or other companies have that, but there isn't as clear, easy access to those data in the public sector. This kind of unequal access of the, uh, to data in pub public versus private sector, does that change the direction of science and the way decisions are made by the farmers in the future? So there are economic questions related to them. How, how do you incentivize for farmers to make those data publicly available? Those kinds of questions kind of come up in uh, this, when you think about agricultural data. Uh, there is privacy and ethics questions too, where, and this is something that is very important to address. Uh, uh, we now have a social scientist, NPL, national program leader on the staff. We started looking at it like this particular year RFA, we are looking at the social implication impacts of uh, gene editing and gene, uh, sorry, genome editing and gene drives technology. Uh, and so a panel specifically for that but perhaps data would be something we should be doing in the future in terms of looking at the social aspects of it as well as ethics of it. And the infrastructure needed to really keep this data publicly available as we are expecting our uh, scientists, the fund funded by public money, to have it publicly available, the open data policies. In agroecosystems, again, when you look at the specific agricultural production system, you have inputs, production, and then outputs kind of model. You get this data for genetic, uh, the technologies, the, uh, you have got labor, capital, natural resources, you're putting inside. The data is coming from all. So 
those systems compared to the ecosystem, again, I'm not an ecologist, most of my training has been organism or below all the way to like biophysics in terms of uh, my publication. On my ecology came because I spent like 12 years also at NSF before going to NIFA. And my division, the when I was division director for, who was across from the division of environmental biology. And so only by diffusion, whatever my knowledge of ecology <laughs> is. Yeah, so uh, what, I, what actually happens in agroecosystem, the major part of it is the management part of it. And looking at that, so data in agroecosystem, you get the genetic variability, microbiomes of all different kinds and how they vary, uh, biodiversity, soil, water, air, and I'm calling air not just atmosphere, because is the air around that organism really, that's what makes it different. If you are looking at a dairy system, is the air around those cows makes a lot more difference to them. And then the management practices. And by this, then you can get nutrient status, energy status, looking at the whole system level. But and there are sources, and we had talks where they talked about uh, NEON, uh, LTARs, and ARs, which are also another places where long term data has been collected. But it's not really completely looking at all. So, one of the questions that always comes do we need more LTR sites so that we can collect long term agricultural data in environment? Or, and because right now there are maybe eight sites at ARS. And some of the LTER sites, long-term ecological research station sites, are also produced there at like Kellogg Station, for example, has agricultural uh, component to it. The uh, Ag Experiment Station data, which I just talked about, the climate data, and then USDA agencies provide data, and um, I'm not that proud. All of these agencies are providing data in all different format, all different levels of accessibility, all different platforms. And uh, so it's not many times I hear it's not as easy to get the soil data in, from an RCSS site or uh, ARS data or forest service data. All of this can be then used. The heterogeneity and availability, multi-scale analysis, connections to solutions is something that is also particularly now is becoming very important. Whenever people talk about agroecosystems, it always comes to probably the solutions for the policy makers. But how do you really bring solutions for the farmers and the consumers is becoming more and more important these days in order to be able to really convince lawmakers that this is something that should be funded. One of the other particular, I think, point and that just came in previous talks too, data is not the solution. It's an input that causative versus correlative relationship is something that one has to always consider. And that's why it's the synthesis and then the providing solutions to either consumers or producers is becomes really important. Is there a need? Like there is NSYS, which is National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis. Is there a need that something like that is required in the ag agroecosystem space so that we can, can have that synthesis and analysis capability in agriculture? Again, these are some of the questions that I'm raising. So in order to kind of tackle this and finding out where the role for NEFA is in this, uh, this is, has been NIFA's strategy. So in October, we had a summit where we invited people from different uh, places uh, uh, and talked about uh, data and what are need, what's needed in agriculture for uh, using data for uh, agricultural sciences. Uh, uh, the, Big data uh, spoke from Iowa State as well as Sci who has helped us in organizing that. Uh, when we looked at the whole spectrum, we thought about generation and collection of data, handling, as well as how do we get from data to actually decisions and then finally impacts. So these are the three areas we kind of looked at and the discussions were organized. Uh, we also looked at data literacy and education. Uh, 
in, and, and it's not just you have to have a data science degree, but how do you really incorporate data science in other general curricula so that the graduates, the undergraduates, whether they are in arts majors or science majors, have that data literacy when they graduate. Uh, and then uh, ethics and policy related analysis. What we found out, we also had the uh, ideas engine, which is uh, online, where people did put in ideas, comment, edited each other's ideas, and voted on each other's ideas to come up with some prioritized list of what should NIFA be doing in a variety of these different areas. So how do we get this to, from observational science to information science to predictive science? It's something that I think NIFA is worried about. This is what we found in that particular workshop and died as engine, just putting all of that input in one slide. So I think again and again we, it came that we need to focus on open data fair principles. So it needs to be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. That's what it, we need to have. We also want to have community building kind of support so that communities around different domains will be able to come together to look at standards, ontologies, common data resources, whether there's a need or even though there may not be need. They may not be ready yet. But that type of community building in different areas is something people looked at. Another one that we saw was need in small data to big data. That's how like, like I call it. Because we have a lot of data, again, distributed. How do you pull it together so that you can get to big data? Um, and that's where the value or incentives for making data public comes in. Uh, yes, we don't, do farmers know what's the value of their data when they are trying to, say, put it in the system or pull, give it to the uh, private companies? Uh, what is the digitization uh, of these old records? Is that something that should be, we should be investing in? And then the infrastructure, databases, right? who manages this, who owns this, who keeps them running? Uh, on a long-term basis, and then training and education. One of the, the things that NIFA is offering now is up to $50,000 for workshop in specific domains to come up with white papers in terms of what they need in that area, so that we can incorporate that input in our next years, then our phase, to provide opportunities to actually uh, uh, work on, like, uh, uh, actually implement some of these needs that we found. So in other words, the systems approaches for sustainable agriculture systems are something that we are emphasizing in the future. Uh, enhancing agriculture productivity or protecting the environment or strengthening the bioeconomy, improving nutrition and food safety, whatever is the goal of agriculture sciences are, we think that data science is critical to achieving those goals. Agriculture is changing. It's changing it's, uh, with people and players, as I was just talking, new and new people who are coming in agriculture. And those are more diverse. More women are entering agriculture as farm or like owners than uh, men. Uh, they are more and more increasingly diverse in terms of ethnicity, national origins. So the, the players are changing, a lot of private investment, particularly in the data space, or these new innovations in agriculture are coming from private industry and not from public sector. We are also changing the products, this is not only those new kinds of foods, but also new types of crops to be grown. We are also changing the places where we do agriculture. Uh, it could be vertical farming, it could be farming and uh, urban farming, which is, well, has more social impacts aspects to it. So the, the places are changing. And as we were just talking, the information is also changing uh, because we are getting more and more of it, it's not just data, but also information, hopefully, coming from the data. So the changing face of this new agriculture has all these things uh, coming up new. So it's really an exciting time in agriculture as it is being transformed into something that has been 
now addressing the complex needs in the future. So we do listen, and as I told you, there are those fact workshops that we should be uh, investing in, and if there are like something somebody wants to organize one on this topic so that there's a white paper that comes out, and it doesn't have to be in person, it can be digital, whichever way you want to get that domain area, figuring out what kind of needs they have in this space. And then we will be having in November a kind of a stakeholder science priority input workshop that can help us figure out the future directions since the administration has changed, the priorities will change, and we hope during that first year this kind of input coming to us from the stakeholders will help us convince the new administration where we should be emphasizing in the future. So we do want to listen to you, and that was one of the things, really exciting part of being here is to listening to all these talks and think and discussions and uh, uh, finding out what's really on your mind. Thank you, and uh, if you have, any, you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Plenty of time for questions, so please. Yes. Yes. Um, one thing that always concerns me in presentations like this, uh, you mentioned very briefly at the beginning the issue of increasing population, but then after that, uh, you didn't really uh, discuss any ways of doing something about slowing down or reversing population growth. And the problem is that we, unless that's done, all of the uh, technological methods that you mentioned here will be negated. Yeah, uh, uh, you are absolutely correct. Mm -hmm. However, the, some of the techniques, at least what I have read in say PNS and others, in, even in the China one uh, child policy or something of that sort, doesn't really help. I mean, I think that particular PNS paper was that one child policy didn't doesn't really help China to avoid environmental problems that are going to happen because the population there already is high. Uh, and so those are more policy decisions where probably we don't have much control over, at least in USDA. Uh, <laughs> so we worry about the uh, other part. But you, you are absolutely right because, uh, okay, there will be 10 billion, whatever, by 2050. There will be a lot more by uh, year 3000, whatever, year 2020. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, that, that, that's a major problem. Um, maybe let the natural cost, like, another plague will arrive, right? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah, I was wondering one thing that hasn't been discussed here, um, and I'm yeah. all yeah. familiar with the agricultural uh, uh -huh. areas of uh, uh, engineering sure. the impact. Uh, but one, one aspect is the carbon footprint that's created by um, Automating and yeah. creating more sensing yeah. capabilities. Um, <laughs> is there a point where uh, this becomes a net negative? Yeah. So yeah, I, I used to in like before January in a similar talk. I used to have some slides about that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, I don't I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. No, I think that that environmental cost is one part of agroecosystems. It's something that we've got to really also start looking into, and that's part of the data, right? And, and, and when you look at the systems, you are not just looking at what goes in, but what comes out, and not just the profitability, but the environmental costs as well. Uh, so, so the model for like productivity generally in the past just looked at economic part, right? What cost of labor, cost of this. But, but I think now some people have started to put in the environmental aspect and the cost of that, monetizing it and putting it in the uh, equation. And I think that's really very important in terms of uh, when you look at increase in productivity, for example. Right. So yeah. Another dimension. Dimension, exactly. Trade-off. Trade -off, yeah. Do you, do you 
you mentioned uh, social impacts as part of the NEPA panel. Yeah. Is that uh, limited to the social impacts in the U.S. and what sort of social impacts, or is it a part of No, it, 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 it's broad. So this time we just limited to a specific technology, which is essentially genome editing and gene drives. Uh, because we wanted to see what the demand is out there first. Uh, we are also talking with the social, behavioral, and economic sciences at NSF to see what we can do together. We, we do have a lot of these programs with NSF, with engineering, computer science, and biology directorate, but not with social sciences yet, because uh, they do have the STS program, science, technology, and society program. And so, uh, whether we can, by collaborating with them, what we have found, whenever we collaborate with them, a lot of agriculture-related proposals get funded through NSF. So we may put only $5 million, but a lot more gets funded agriculture-related in that program then. And so I think that's another thing that we are in discussion with them, so that uh, a broader technology in agriculture we can look at. Okay, great. Yes. Um, so it sounds like there's a lot of focus on reducing inputs and increasing yields um, with USDA admission. I was wondering if there's also, if USDA is trying to nudge um, consumption patterns towards um, foods that have a lower impact. Yeah. So yeah. Like lower, um, meat and diet. Uh, or lowering waste, right? And. Uh, uh, that's, that's, that's one of the bigger priorities also just lowering waste uh, of food, uh, like at consumer uh, level. Uh, we just had a talk from uh, who, who is a food service manager for IBM. So they feed like 60,000 people in IBM and they have do urban farming, like a lot of their buildings have like towers of currently just microgreens and lettuce is what they grow, but they will use those in the kitchen to actually uh, feed people, uh, so that the people have connection to food right in the buildings where they work. So one of the things they have started doing is this uh, progress for reducing food waste in restaurants themselves. And I think those are the kinds of things definitely we need to do. Uh, but we may not be making that, and I'm, I want to be very frank, as an initiative because it kind of runs against increasing profitability for the farmers. And the Act Committee is what gives us our appropriation. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, I'm wondering about the kinds of difficulties you'll have in explaining to people how you came to some of these decisions, explaining to farmers, for example, yeah. how big data works and machine learning works. Okay. We've all been sitting here learning so much, and it's difficult to um, yeah. understand how some of these technologies work. How would, do you have uh, people who are trying to figure out ways of explaining these technologies in ways that can be digestible without uh, advanced degrees? Yeah, so we, we are depending on our cooperative extension service to be able to do that. <laughs> and that's, that's one of the, our funding stream, right, uh, for capacity funds uh, for both experiment station as well as extension. Uh, and I think the, uh, that's, that's where I think it will come to in terms of explaining to the farmers. And again, at the university level, whether that, if that is happening or not, how these new technologies are introduced, because it's not just what company gives you, whether farmers are able to decide what is valuable, what is not, right? Make those decisions. And that's what, because that's the, uh, and we have been talking with economic like, research uh, service, in, because that's the part of this unequal access to uh, data in, with the Precision Act comes in, where private companies, and that's also fragmented, different companies have different sets of data available to them, uh, and not as much available in the public sector. How do you then, how do have the decisions made and the directions in which science develops? Uh, in terms of what, what is applied on the farms. Uh, and uh, there, it's a, there are economic questions in there, social questions in there. Uh, and is it really 
we shouldn't worry about it, right? In, in genomics area, like plant genomics I'm more familiar with, initially there was a lot of data available in the private sector, uh, very little when the plant genome research program came along, a lot of those that got sequenced, public de sector data came in, and then the private industry discovered having the data publicly available actually is helpful to them because to understand how to use the data to derive information and finally make the decision, more, more people actually have a look at it and try it out and use different minds to actually work at those data. It makes, I think, much faster progress than just keeping it close. That's, that's what the genomics community, and I think Edgar is, I think, nodding on this. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I think the previous question was like, is the USDA doing anything to promote healthier diet yes. with uh, less dairy and meat production in terms of promoting uh, with a lower uh, carbon footprint? And because if we're going to feed the world, you know, the, and the developing countries are saying, oh, we want more, we want meat. There's the lower economic. Every society around the world is going to be starving. Yeah. So we, we do find we have a program called AFNIP, which is the, for the Food and Nutrition Education Program, which is about $60, $70 million a year, which is funded through the extension service for specifically that. How do people, educating people to make decisions. And this is in relation to because we, the most of USDA's budget is for food stamps. So how do they use the food stamp money to actually make uh, which kind of foods they are buying in order to help them make the right decisions? That nutrition uh, education part comes into play. Yes. yes. Yeah. When the, when the farmer gets his information, uh, he gets information from you researchers from extension, from companies. And companies may be biased, they may exaggerate, yeah. <laughs> they, they may destroy the picture. Do you know how a farmer sorts all this stuff out? Yeah. Uh, do they lean towards extension and real research like you do? Or do they often get swayed by uh, the big business uh, uh, talk about. I, again, uh, <laughs> so uh, we hope that they have these trust relationships with their extension agents, so they trust them a lot more than somebody just uh, where there is a financial interest at stake, right? Uh, uh, however, we leave it with the extension service to figure out what, how they manage that at the county level or at the state level. Uh, so we don't really directly go and tell them this is what you should be doing. I don't know if there are any studies where in terms of farmer behavior, which kind of advice has more influence. Perhaps immediate profitability may be the profitability may be the more kind of driving factor in making those decisions, but you may know more I, about yeah, it. Yeah, I work on the pest uh, seed sales and stuff like that and insecticides and extension is not high in the list. Yeah. What they get it directly from the seed people selling it, but they all know people selling it to them have a financial incentive. Yeah. So they also like to have some other third party verification. <laughs> and then um, a lot of times extension is more it's the, they're the ones who teach the people who do the um, actual sales and stuff as well. So it's there's I can give you a couple papers for instance that Basically, the source of information tends to be other sectors which extensions support. Yeah. Direct extensions impact is more indirect. Okay. Right? Um, so yeah. yeah. I mean, there's competition. Yeah. Okay. Even that one I just got. That's my science paper on seed trees. That's a source of information. Yeah. Uh, there's a graphic in there for seed sales or for seed mm -hmm. sales. What are the information from? Let's take uh, one one more question. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm sad you're all day listening to all the talks, and uh, you have one slide up there that really kind of that was this idea of big data being observational to informative to predictive. Yeah. And I'm just wondering if there's any way that we can get to the predictive side of things 
given that we can't even predict the weather. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's an aspirational goal, right? Yeah. Last year, yeah. <laughs> we're fear mongered into listening to data about Godzilla and the law uh, with weather yeah. patterns that were occurring in the Pacific. Yeah. And um, I don't know how many made adjustments because of that. But uh, last year was a record year. Yeah. yeah. If you listen to the winter of 2016, yeah. it was going to be a disaster yeah. in 2016. And so are we just fooling ourselves here, trying to get new state data when we can't even predict where we are really need to go? If you can tell me what the weather's going to be, I can tell you as an agronomist. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but yeah. that seems to me to be a real yeah. uh, stumbling block here. I don't know how you overcome that. I'm just no, no I, I think you are absolutely right. And that's why I think uh, one of, I think you, somebody presented that cover up the fact, like the, uh, the limits of prediction, right? Right now, and that's why, like, when I was at NSF, we talked about prediction, but in terms of molecular kind of circuits and uh, uh, systems, where I think the need was more developing more theory in order to be able to model better, in order to kind of make the more uh, reliable predictions. This is a lot more complex situation because there's a behavior involved. They don't just follow the laws of physics. And I think that's where I think that, that complexity, and again, as I was just mentioning, it's an aspirational goal. I don't know it will happen in my lifetime. Uh, uh, and I think, but you always have to have the aspirational goals. Well, let's thank Dr. Chipman. Yeah.